Welcome to the Adams County Historical Society. Today's program takes a different kind of look at the Battle of Gettysburg and its aftermath. Our speaker, Charles Joyce from Philadelphia, is a collector of Civil War photographs with a specialty of photographs of soldiers and civilians in Gettysburg in 1863. Charles, in his full-time career, is a lawyer representing labor unions in Philadelphia. In his part-time career, he is a senior editor at Military Images magazine. And in what little time he has left, he is a landscape painter and a collector of photographs from the Civil War. Thank you. I started collecting images of Civil War soldiers about 30 years ago. And about 20 years ago, I started focusing my collection on images like this one of a Union soldier who was killed in the wheat field. My collection now encompasses soldiers who were either killed, wounded, or captured during the Gettysburg campaign. And self-evidently, most of their stories don't end well. I also, though, became interested in collecting images and artifacts that dealt with how the town of about 2,400 people in 1863 was able to handle a number of wounded and dying soldiers that were in the 20,000 range. A number of years ago, I acquired a grouping of an ID carte de visite, or a CDV, of a Union private taken in Wisconsin, a young woman taken by the Tyson brothers in Gettysburg, and an 1865 marriage certificate. Research at the Gettysburg National Military Park and the Adams County Historical Society enabled me to tell their story, and it's a true story of romance, born among the tragedy of the battle, fueled by these photographs. It has mostly a happy ending too. The soldier was Jacob Frederick Gundrum, a German immigrant from a town near present-day Frankfurt who came to America in 1856 and traveled to Wisconsin to live with a sister where he taught music. Five years later, war broke out and Jacob enlisted in the 2nd Wisconsin Infantry, part of the famous Iron Brigade. He helped to form the Iron Brigade Band, which became almost as famous as the fighting men of that brigade. By 1863, Jacob was a melancholy man, lonely and sick of war. He would write that by then he had, quote, lost confidence in myself, in mankind, even in my own creator. Oh, how my heart often longed to love someone. Young woman was Susanna Hare, 19 years old in 1863, the youngest child of Frederick Hare and Susanna Lind. Hare occupied the tavern west of town that bore his name and the ridge it occupied until the mid-1850s, when financial woes forced him to let go of his license and sell the property. He moved his family into a home on West Middle Street that he built on an empty lot he owned. Susie was a pious girl. She wrote that the only good thing about living in the borough was that she was near to church and can go to it in all kinds of weather. Living alone with aged parents, all her older sisters married, Susie lamented, I often wish I had a sister single. I get so lonely sometimes. On July 1st, as the Iron Brigade fought and suffered crippling casualties, many of its wounded were carried to the newly erected Adams County Courthouse, where the chairs to the courtroom were thrown out the windows to make room and tables pulled together to make one long operating table. Fanny Buhler, a young townswoman, described horrific scenes there of soldiers lying on the bare floor, covered with blood and dirt and vermin. One man, she recalled, had a great cavern in his side, his lungs protruding several inches. Another had both his eyes shot out, with five other wounds on his body. I stopped my ears that I might not hear the cries and groans of the wounded and the dying men, she said. Susie, Susie's home was less than two blocks west of the courthouse. A corporal in the second Wisconsin, Charles C. Bushy, was badly wounded in the fighting and made his way to the courthouse, lucky enough to find a chair that he quickly collapsed into. He was also lucky to have a young girl standing over him, fanning flies from his face. It was Susie. She had obviously hurried from her house to do what she could for the wounded and dying in the courthouse. Where Jacob was, 
during the battle is itself unclear. Being in the band, he wasn't among the fighting ranks, but may have helped with the wounded in the courthouse. What we do know is that after the battle, after Lee's army had been driven away, the Iron Brigade band stayed in town for the rest of the month of July, playing tunes at the various hospitals, especially the courthouse, to boost the spirits of the wounded. This may have been where he first espied Susie. He later wrote, When I first saw you, you appeared to me like an angel sent down from heaven to comfort and console me. Susie was also quickly smitten. She warded off the amorous attentions of one of Gunman's bandmates, Alfred E. Havens, and she marked her initials on a handkerchief and had her next-door neighbor, Rachel Newport, wife of the Baker Belter Newport, give it to Gundrum. Jacob wrote, when he received the handkerchief, he was vain enough to think that you cared for me. After that, he often looked up to her windows, trying to catch a glimpse of her sweet face, he wrote. There it was, my own darling Susie, that I learned to love, he would later tell her. By August, Jacob and the rest of the band returned to their brigade. He left Susie with a CDV of himself taken to Wisconsin and inscribed on the back, Jacob Gundrum, to his dear friend, Susie Hare. The two began writing each other. Their letters contain all of the elements of young love, hope, fear, impatience, jealousy. She writes of being asked to go sledding by a local man and declining only because she had a severe cold, possibly intending to spark a reaction from him. Very soon, talk turned to love. By the time Lincoln came to Gettysburg to dedicate the Soldiers National Cemetery, she wrote how she had hoped to see Jacob there and said, I do not know what I would do if I had not your dear likeness. I spend many hours looking at it. She had an image taken of herself and sent to him. He reported back he had strange spells of melancholy, and the only way to cure them is to take out your picture and kiss it over a thousand times. I am afraid in a short time I shall have kissed it away and you will be obliged to send me a new one. Indeed, by the fall of 1864, Susie returned to Tyson's studio and had another image of herself taken for her beloved bandsman. We know this image is the replacement because it has a residue of a green tax stamp on the back, which dates it to the period of October 1864. And Gundrum mentions in a letter to Susie of his joy of receiving it, and how he placed it on the shelf of a log hut he'd constructed with his bandmates for winter quarters. He wrote, You will not be angry, dearest, for exposing your portrait to the views of so many, but I love to look at it, and sometimes in the evening, when I lay down, and the fireplace is still burning, and it shows me your picture so plainly, I lay looking at it until I fall asleep, only to dream of you. You may think this is a little silly, but my love for you, dearest, knows no boundary, and everything that comes from you is sacred and beloved to me. By this time, their relationship had progressed to the point that marriage was openly and often discussed. Gundrum had secured a furlough to come to Gettysburg and meet Susie's parents, a prospect that seemed to terrify him, but that apparently went well. Susie also wrote frankly to him about how she wanted their union to go. She was one, she insisted, who is ever ready to alleviate your sorrow or share your joy, one who intends as long as life remains to love you first as a lover, then as a husband should be loved, and of course expects the same love and kind treatment in return. Too many marriages, my dear, begin like the rosy morning and then fall away like a sun wreath. And why is it? Because the married pair neglect to be as pleasuring to each other as after the marriage as before. God forbid that should be the case with us. If it should be so, it shall not be my fault. He told her in late 1864 that he tried to get a furlough, and while they were almost impossible to secure at that point, he promised to get one. Believe me, dearest, I shall try everything in my power, the thought of holding you once more in my arms, to press you to my bosom and to kiss those sweet lips will encourage me. He even offered to purchase a suit of civilian clothes from some friends he knew in Baltimore, so I shall not have to make my appearance in this despised uniform of blue. Gundrum, thoroughly sick of the war by then, and with something now to live for, had become a Democrat. 
and voted against Lincoln in the 1864 presidential election, mainly because he feared that the president would extend the war if he was reelected. He also, like many of his fellow seasoned soldiers, blamed, quote, the abolitionists for getting the country into its current situation almost as much as the rebels. Lincoln, of course, prevailed, and any dismay Gundrum felt at the result of the election was relieved when, at the end of January 1865, his captain secured Gundrum a furlough of 20 days with the express purpose of getting married, adding that the father of his intended is very sick at present, who wishes to see his daughter married, and that Gundrum desires to go and fulfill his engagement. Although the captain's furlough request mistakenly, perhaps deliberately so, indicated that Gundrum was returning to Wisconsin to marry, Gundrum made a beeline to Gettysburg where, on February 5th, 1865, he and Susie were wed at their parents' home by the Reverend William R. H. Dietrich of the Trinity Reformed Church. Their wedding certificate also bears the tax revenue stamp required not only on photographs, but on all official documents to generate revenue to continue and finish the war. Another note, the witness for the ceremony, in addition to Susie's mother and father, was Samuel R. Collins, a student at Gettysburg's Pennsylvania College who had, along with many of his classmates, served in the 26th Pennsylvania Emergency Militia during the Gettysburg Campaign. Gundam returned to the front, and the next time he wrote to Susie, he was able to address her as my adored wife. Writing to her less than a month after Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox, he said, I am in hopes that in less than two months, I shall have the pleasure to clasp you again to my heart, to part no more. Gundrum's hopes were realized. He mustered out and moved to Gettysburg, and he and Susie started a family. But tragedy struck the couple early. Their first child, Louis Jacob, conceived when they were first wed and born on October 27, 1865, passed away the following July. In August 1867, they had another son, Frederick William, but he lived an even shorter life, dying in early March of 1868. By this time, Jacob had filed papers to become a naturalized citizen in the same Adams County courthouse where he first met his wife. The pair moved to Hanover, where Gundrum returned to teaching music and was elected a justice of the peace. Susie then proceeded in quick succession to bear Jacob three more sons in 1869, 1870, and 1873. All three would survive. Susie, however, lived less than a decade longer. She died in 1882 at the age of 38. Jacob never remarried. In his later years, he learned to reconcile himself to his military service and surely felt a justifiable pride in having taken part in the war with such a legendary outfit as the Iron Brigade. This image, taken by a York photographer, is of an elderly Jacob Gundrum, proudly wearing a medal, marking him as a soldier in that unit. That same medal is seen on this photo of the brigade's first commander, General John Gibbon, who posed with it at Devil's Den when he visited the battlefield in 1892. Jacob died at his son Charlie's home in York, Pennsylvania on September 23, 1904. He was reunited with Susie in a common grave at Hanover's Mount Olivet Cemetery. So I'd like to ask Charles how he finds photographs of Civil War soldiers. Are they still out there? Yeah, it, it has its challenges. For one hand, on the one hand, they're economic challenges because you put the name Gettysburg. Uh, at the end of any description of an image or, or an artifact, and the price point goes up. Uh, also, you have to be unfortunately concerned about a number of um, forgeries out there. There are there are collectors that um, are not necessarily the most scrupulous people, and they will say that an image has a Gettysburg connection, or they'll say that an artifact has a Gettysburg connection, and it really doesn't. Interestingly, that sort of um, dubious provenance has been part of the Gettysburg story since 1863. Hmm. Uh, if you look at some of the early collections, there were people that were bringing artifacts in from Antietam and labeled label them as Gettysburg. Um, 
artifacts. Also, I've I've encountered in my years of research a number of soldiers who claimed that they were wounded at Gettysburg and weren't wounded at Gettysburg. <laughs> so it has its challenges. But they are out there. There are some really good collections that I've been able to tap into over the years. I've developed some great friendships with uh, fellow collectors who know my interest and who help me out when they see something they think I'd be interested in. So it, it just takes a little bit of practice knowing what to look for, being kind of having a default as, of being skeptical about a story and doing your best to research it. And that's really where the internet has been very valuable because it allows you to tap into repositories like the Adams County Historical Society or the Gettysburg National Military Park or libraries around the country, around the world that have collections pertaining to soldiers who were killed, wounded, or captured at Gettysburg. I've also been fortunate to work with Military Images magazine that's edited by Ron Cottington. I'm one of the senior editors of the magazine. It's the premier magazine for collectors of Civil War images to showcase their collections and to write about their collections. I'd also add that Ron has recently published a book called Gettysburg Faces, which is a collection of images and stories of men who were killed, wounded, captured, or did something noteworthy in the Gettysburg campaign. And I'm honored to have a number of my images in that publication. Thank you for sharing this story with us, and we will look forward to seeing more from your amazing collection. Thank you from the Adams County Historical Society.